Microphone, please. Two uh, housekeeping points for you. So the first one being that uh, this uh, event is translated in French. Uh, and you have your headset, so you can follow in French if you desire to. And the second point is uh, there will be a broadcast. I mean, this event will be broadcasted on uh, UN Web TV. So we assume that if you are in the room, you consent to be kind of uh, appearing on that uh, broadcast. Okay, so now let me be more formal. So the permanent representative of uh, Norway to the United uh, Nations, Brand, I mean, I should now really, Bradestit, correct? Yes. <laughs> uh, the director of the Central and Southern African Division, DPPA, DPO, Michael uh, Kingsley. Uh, our esteemed partners and researchers, and of course, distinguished guests, all the protocol observed. Uh, good morning. So I am... Um, Catherine Andela, for those who don't know me, I'm the chief gender unit of the Department of Peace Operations, so DPO. So on this 24th anniversary of the landmark UN Security Council uh, Resolution 1325, I'm very pleased to welcome and thank you all for joining us in person and virtually uh, for this timely discussion on advancing women, peace, and security, lessons drawn from the DRC in the margin of the WPS week. Uh, it is a great privilege hosting this event with all partners. So I welcome also the presence of all our senior gender advisors from the peacekeeping missions, and I will just like briefly like uh, tell them to stand up when I, 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 I mention that. Uh, we have the senior gender advisor from uh, ANFISIP, okay, uh, from MONUSCO, uh, ANMIS, MINUSCA, ONSOS, UNISFA, ANMIC. And of course, our thoughts to uh, the gender advisor who is based at Unifil, who couldn't make it. So this event is part of uh, DPO's collaborative partnership on policy and practice with peacekeeping stakeholders from the UN, from the African Union, from the uh, Kofi Annan Training Center, the Stimson Center, and NUPI. Today's concern being where are we and how do we bridge existing gaps, taking into account our political and operational reality. So the discussion follows research on WPS implementation in MONUSCO from 2019. So the panelists will reflect and propose forward-looking recommendations and the session moderator is uh, Dr. Andrew Yao Che, who is the senior research fellow and training for peace coordinator NUPI. Uh, he will introduce our esteemed discussions as we delved into the substantive session. So, to, so, so with any further ado, to start off, uh, I invite a DPO representative, the director of Central and Southern African Division, DPPA DPO, Michael Kingsley, uh, to give us his opening remarks. Michael? Thank you, Catherine. Excellencies, distinguished guests, we thank you all for joining us this morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you on the 24th anniversary of the landmark Security Council resolution on women, peace, and security. I should say, 
uh, for the avoidance of doubt that I am speaking here on behalf of Under Secretary General Lacroix and Assistant Secretary General Pobi. I would like to say that in the spirit of our common quest for sustained achievement of this resolution's goals, we are gathered here to draw lessons from peacekeeping missions, in particular from our mission in the DRC. But we are also here to reflect on the future implementation of the WPS mandate. I'll start by offering special thanks to our partners who are represented here. We, in no particular order, we have the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, we have the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center, we have the Training for Peace Program and the Permanent Mission of Norway. The African Union is also here and of course we have all our esteemed researchers and the panelists for today's discussion. We appreciate all our partners for your collaboration in today's dialogue and also for your long-standing partnership in progressively developing policy and best practice in peacekeeping. Since the adoption of Resolution 1325, peace operations have made considerable progress in implementing the WPS agenda. Still, we know that there is much more to be done. In all areas of our operations, we need strategic, innovative, and practical initiatives to achieve lasting changes that will further advance the WPS agenda. We are trusting that your contributions throughout today's proceedings will help us to identify not only gaps, but also solutions to the continuing challenges. On our part, the Department of Peace Operations is committed to advancing women's participation and to integrating gender responsive perspectives and policies. This commitment is a political and strategic imperative. We know that the core WPS objectives are critical for building resilient communities. We also know that investments to institutionalize WPS intrinsically contribute to sustainable peace, security, and economic stability. We seek to achieve these objectives in all aspects of peacekeeping, from the work of our uniformed colleagues and conflict prevention and resolution to peace negotiations, peace building, and stabilization efforts. At the same time, we recognize that achieving our WPS goals requires ensuring that leadership accountability, creative resourcing, and partnerships remain at the core of our work. The Democratic Republic of Congo, in all its complexities, is a unique proving ground for the WPS agenda. And I say this both in terms of the challenges that country presents and the opportunities that it offers. In this regard, there are many, there are many positives. To his credit, President Chisekedi demonstrated his commitment to the WPS agenda in appointing the DRC's first female prime minister and this was alongside other women cabinet ministers. MONUSCO's role continues to be instrumental in many ways, in promoting women's leadership, ensuring women's meaningful participation in political and peace processes, protecting women and girls from human rights abuses and violations. We commend MONUSCO's important efforts to promote the participation of women voters and candidates during the 2023 general elections. This illustrates the impact of effective collaboration between host governments and the United Nations. In late 2002, the mission also supported the participation of women during the third round of consultations between the DRC government 
and representatives of armed groups and communities. We must build on this progress to further enhance the meaningful participation of women in all political and peace processes. Distinguished colleagues, while applauding the DRC's many advances and MONUSCO's impressive work, and I must say, not only MONUSCO's impressive work, but the impressive work being done by all the colleagues here representing all the other missions, I want to recognize you at this point. This, we have DRC in the title of this morning's gathering, but that just takes nothing away from the work, excellent work that is being done by all of you. So while we applaud the many advances that have been achieved and the impressive work around our peacekeeping operations, we should also acknowledge that the goal of transformative change and equality remain painfully elusive. For the WPS agenda, many challenges persist in peacekeeping. They include the dominance of power politics with shrinking political and civic space for women's meaningful participation, perennial security threats, militarism and protection concerns, entrenched social and cultural inequalities, and funding constraints. These and other impediments collectively undermine our efforts and investments across the board. Bridging the gaps and accelerating WPS implementation in our missions require all of us to redouble our concerted efforts. Each one of us has an important role to play, whether as member states, UN entities, regional organizations, civil society organizations, think tanks, or academia. The WPS agenda will not implement itself. Ultimately, that requires political leadership, genuine and shared commitment from stakeholders, and sustained funding. These are the ingredients for realizing, ultimately, the objectives that we share. In crisis and conflict situations, we need to step up our efforts to harness the full potential of contributions from women. In all contexts, we must ensure that gender is recognized and meaningfully discussed. And we must bear in mind that women's rights and the protection of women and children are fundamental elements of international humanitarian law and human rights law. This means that advancing WPS is not optional. It is mandatory and obligatory for everyone. Today, with all of this in mind, we have an opportunity to learn from the past and to be better prepared for the emerging challenges of today and tomorrow. Please join me in believing that our exchanges this morning will make an important contribution to our collective efforts to advance the protection of women and to enhance their contributions to peace. We look forward to a stimulating and productive discussion. Thank you. Michael Kingsley. I now hand over to Dr. Andrew uh, to take us through the, the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, and thank you, colleagues, for being here today. Um, we'll move swiftly to our, um, our first uh, presentation or section. Um, so I'd like to quickly introduce uh, the lead authors. The first is uh, Lisa Charland, who is a senior fellow and director of the Protecting Civilians and Human Security Program at the Stimson Center. Um, and she is joined by Dr. Jenny Lorentz, who is a senior fellow with the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, um, who conducts research on women, peace and security and gender in relation to peace processes, peacekeeping, 
peace building and security sector reform. Um, after that, we'll then move to our panel discussion. You have the floor. Andrew. Um, uh, first of all, I would just like to thank, on behalf of Lisa and myself, I guess, um, to thank everyone who has contributed to the report, uh, including our co-authors, contributors, and reviewers, also especially the interviewees and the mission, and our funders. Uh, and we also want to thank the hosts and organizers of this event, um, and the audience who are with us today. Um, so this report, uh, which is uh, available in full on NUPI's uh, website, nupi.no, this report is a result of a collaborative effort between many individuals and institutions, and it examines how MONUSCO has worked to implement the WPS dimensions of its mandate in the period from uh, 2010 to 2021. And to do so, we first analyzed uh, WPS language in the mandate resolution texts from 2010 to 2021. And this analysis showed both a quantitative and a qualitative expansion of WPS language in the mandates in this period. So quantitatively, there was a substantial increase in the number of references since 2013 with the highest number recorded in 2021. When it comes to the qualitative or thematic expansion, WPS language in MONUSCO's mandates reflects on the one hand, overall trends in UN Security Council mandates, uh, such as the gradual inclusion of language that encourages women's participation in conflict resolution, conflict prevention, and peace and security processes. And on the other hand, uh, the language reflects the developments in the situation on the ground, including the continued emphasis on preventing and responding to violence against women. The second and the main part of the analysis in the report focuses on how and to what extent the mission has been able to implement the WPS elements of its mandate, and what factors have impacted on the ability of the mission to achieve the mandated goals and tasks. And this part is based on an analysis of documents and interviews with mission personnel. And I will hand over to Lisa Charlen now, who will share some of these key findings and recommendations from the report. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you to all of you for, for joining us today. And I echo the thanks that Jenny has extended to our partners, co-authors, funders, uh, and particularly those in the mission who engaged with us on this research. At the outset, I briefly wanted to note, so this report has followed uh, the methodology that we've used for upon studies, um, and that was adapted to focusing on the women, peace and security agenda. So in this study, we focus briefly on four explanatory factors, matching mandates and resources, primacy of participation, improving gender responsiveness and also addressing gender assumptions and stereotypes, and building trust in a protective environment. So how do we look at people-centred approaches? In the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight three brief findings from the report, and we would be happy to go into other points later in the discussion. The first, I think, that is uh, worth referring to at the moment is looking at the gender scorecard that has been developed by MONUSCO as an accountability mechanism on women, peace and security. The gender scorecard seeks to assess how different components or sections in the mission have integrated gender sensitive approaches in their work. Structurally, the approach to gender in MONUSCO is quite decentralised, with the Gender Affairs Unit providing technical and advisory support in the mission. And what this means, in effect, is that the substantive sections, political affairs, civil affairs, the force, the police, and I should say that's not to say the Gender Affairs Unit is not a substantive section, but just by distinction, those sections are responsible for integrating gender-sensitive activities into their work. So the scorecard assesses each of these sections in terms of how they are going about those efforts and where they rank. And the intention with the scorecard is to assist leadership and the gender affairs team in directing support where needed across the mission. 
And we thought this was quite an innovative tool because so often ensuring there is accountability for women, peace and security can be a real challenge in peacekeeping missions. The second aspect I want to focus on is the finding emerging on participation as relates to supporting women's meaningful participation in the security sector, peace processes, governance institutions uh, and political processes such as elections. In the context of MINUSCO, part of these efforts have been directed on furthering women's participation in political parties and electoral processes, as we've heard a little earlier. There have been legislative reforms to incentivise the inclusion of women as registered candidates with political parties. And to advance many of those efforts, MINUSCO has focused on activating women's leagues, combating hate speech, focusing on the protection of leaders at risk, as well as training and workshops to enhance women's participation at the local level. Yet, there remains an attitude um, across parts of Congolese society that women cannot win ele elections, and that is often weaponised given the insecurity. And this points to some of the challenges for peacekeeping missions in terms of influencing structural change uh, in these contexts. On the issue of peace processes, one of the challenges that is being faced and that was shared with us in the interviews is that women are not viewed as fighters. Conflict reinforces social behaviours that marginalise women from decision making. And so the mission has been working to establish a women mediators network, for instance, to elevate women's participation in some of these processes. But there still remains a significant gap. So while we've seen some progress, for instance, in the Nairobi process, and MINUSCO had worked to identify women to participate in the third round of those consultations, we know by contrast in the Luanda process, it has been more challenging because it's largely been heads of state who have been engaged, and they, of course, tend to be men. The final area I would like to focus on briefly is the issue of gender responsiveness. An example that was provided to us in, in the context of South Kivu at the time that we were doing the interviews in 2021 was regarding the issue of food insecurity and the impact that was having on driving men into to join armed groups. And I think this really highlights the importance of gender sensitive conflict analysis and what that means for the way that missions respond. In this context, MINUSCO supported efforts to build a market that could support impoverished families to reduce the attractiveness of joining armed groups. So again, this points to the, the importance of making sure gender's not being excluded from these analyses that are being undertaken. Another example that was highlighted was the gender sensitive approach to disarmament, demobilization and reintegration, or through the community violence reduction programs. Historically, these programs have focused on combatants rather than dependents or those that have been victims. And this really needed to change. Uh, because often this excludes women from these processes and support to livelihood programs. And so in this case, this is something that MINUSCO has started to do through these programs, focusing on dependents and victims through livelihood programs, which has extended the number of beneficiaries that benefit from these support, not just combatants and not just men. However, one of the ongoing challenges, of course, is funding. A lack of programmatic funding was cited many times in our interviews as a barrier to undertaking more activities in support of gender mainstreaming. Uh, and that, in some instances, has led to an omission of gender in terms of the projects that are undertaken. Um, and so, just in conclusion, um, I think a brief reflection from us in undertaking this research is that peacekeeping can help promote women, peace and security, but it is a shared responsibility. And often we fail to emphasise that point. There has been significant innovation in MINUSCO to address the gender inequalities in the DRC that are driving the conflict and to create a more gender equal society. The commitment of senior mission leadership is essential, uh, but that's only a starting point. And one of the challenges is that attitudes regarding the centrality of women, peace and security as being mandatory are not shared across the mission. Indeed, one example we were given in the, in the uniform component, for instance, where there were still attitudes to women wearing pants in the mission. Uh, and I think that highlighted some of the, the attitudes that still need to be shifted. So the challenge for MINUSCO moving forward will be how to ensure that WPS remains a priority as part of the transition process and when working with partners in the region, both in terms of other peace operations and UN entities, as well as governance institutions, civil society and local organisations. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you both very much. Um, we're now going to swiftly move over to uh, three esteemed discussants um, who will reflect on some of the key findings from the report, uh, but also uh, with their knowledge and experience, bringing some of, uh, I would say, uh, other aspects that could connect uh, and open the discussion. So our first speaker is uh, Mira Afir, who is the Senior Gender Affairs Officer uh, with MONUSCO. Um, we will then uh, head to Mr. Zinu Agli, who is the Senior Advisor of the African Union Mission to the United uh, Nations and Peace and Security Coordinator of the African Members of the UN Security Council, the A3. Um, and then Dr. Uh, Emma Bokor, who is the Acting Director of Research at the Kofi Annan International uh, Peacekeeping Centre. Uh, all participants will have a, a sort of strict seven minutes, um, and I'm looking at them with a strict seven minutes, um, to reflect on aspects of the report, but also we will then open up for uh, open discussions where um, uh, we can um, discuss more broadly other aspects. Uh, so, uh, Mary, we have the floor. And I'm going to uh, go fast, hoping that I will uh, uh, conclude my uh, comments in seven minutes. And I just want to say that I wish I had prepared my presentation in French, just to have a little bit of diversity, and because the DRC is a French-speaking uh, country, but nevertheless. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, colleagues, the, organi the organizers of this side event for inviting us uh, to participate in this discussion, and uh, the researchers for this uh, insight insightful uh, study on uh, women, peace, and security in the DRC uh, focusing uh, on, on MONUSCO. In terms of what the, the research achieves, uh, I think it provides a strong uh, historical perspective on the evolution of the mandate uh, on women, peace and security. I believe from a, an initial focus on protection and uh, moving uh, uh, broadly to uh, participation and then integration into uh, other uh, mandated uh, priorities. Uh, the research also provides a realistic assessment of the mission's efforts uh, including the, the gender affairs section, but also other sections and components of, the, of MONUSCO to contribute to the realization of WPS uh, in the country. I think I should uh, welcome the spotlight on our work. Uh, the scorecard uh, was mentioned in terms of assessing how sections uh, integrate uh, gender into the implementation of the mandate. And this is across the mission. Uh, the report also mentioned the work that we do on mapping uh, risky areas for women and girls where uh, we go to communities, uh, speak with them, and try to identify where they are the most at, at risk of being attacked by armed groups and then uh, share our findings with uh, protection actors. And the, the work that we do on supporting women mediators network is also uh, one of the, the highlights uh, of the report. Obviously, I think we, we cringed a little bit when we looked at the challenges and constraints, but uh, we welcome the like independent analysis and assessment, and uh, thank you uh, for that. In terms of what has happened uh, since the study, because I think uh, the research uh, kind of stopped in 2021, even though I also saw some updates uh, relating to uh, later uh, development. If we look at the mandate, uh, and the last one is res Resolution 2717, uh, we still have a standalone uh, provision on gender and women, peace and security, gender being considered as a cross-cutting consideration for all the work that uh, the mission does. Uh, the mission also uh, focuses on the support, uh, the re resolution focuses on the support that the mission needs to bring to the government in terms of advancing uh, women's full, equal, effective, and meaningful full participation. It reaffirms the role of women, but also youth, which was uh, innovative in terms of uh, their role, again, in prevention, management, resolution of conflicts. And it underscores another innovation, I would say, the importance of localized approaches to addressing uh, women's needs in conflict, which also helps us to move forward in terms of localizing uh, national action plans and the 1325 uh, agenda. Uh, the mission also um, focuses, but this has been going on already for a couple of mandates, on gender analysis, especially in uh, the Secretary General uh, reports. Uh, 
beside this uh, strong focus on uh, women, peace, and security, and uh, women and youth, uh, the, the, the resolution also continues with the cross-cutting approaches approach, uh, including on DDR, uh, on SSR, security sector reform, uh, which needs to uh, take into account uh, women's full, equal, effective, and meaningful participation and safety. In terms of protection of civilians, also with a focus on sexual and gender-based violence, and another innovation of uh, 2017 uh, is the reference uh, to our unarmed uh, protection uh, of civilians mechanisms, uh, which often uh, involve uh, local women's networks. So it also goes back to the work that we do with women at community level. Just uh, uh, another uh, point on mandate, it's the, the, the support that the mission is now being called upon to provide to the SADC mission in the DRC, uh, SAMI DRC, uh, which has been deployed for like close to a year. And resolution 2746 uh, mentioned the, the technical advice and support on protection of civilians, including women and girls. And it also calls uh, the SAMI DRC TCCs to look at women's representation within uh, the force uh, as a way to prevent uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. I think what has happened uh, concretely uh, since uh, the, the study, uh, you mentioned elections, the director too already uh, mentioned elections. So in terms of statistics, uh, yes, we had 50% of women registered to vote. Uh, we had an increase of uh, women candidates, 17% uh, of all candidates, for example, to the national legislative elections were women. But in terms of results, like uh, we are going back despite the incentives uh, to 14% of women's representation, for example, in the National Assembly, 15% in the Senate, 10% in provincial assemblies, where we had 28% of women candidates, and 19% uh, of women elected to municipal uh, elections. Uh, yes, MONUSCO uh, did a lot of work in terms of preparing candidates uh, with leadership, with communication skills, uh, like also assessing the security environment that could uh, either um, impede or like facilitate, uh, I would say, their campaigning. And uh, uh, we, we did that work, but like really uh, in the end, uh, the, they were not very satisfied in terms of the results of the elections. But like civil society, with the partners, we continued advocating, including with good offices. And uh, we are very pleased to have this first woman who was appointed as prime minister by the president. And in terms of women's representation uh, on the national government, it also went up from 28% to 33%, crossing uh, the 30% uh, uh, like, uh, threshold. One other innovation, uh, it's the appointment of the, the third uh, woman uh, foreign minister. And I think in terms of women, women's participation and leadership in peace processes, it also makes a difference. I don't know if you have seen the photos of the Luanda peace process. Yes, essentially male, especially like when they were all male uh, foreign ministers, but now with Minister uh, uh, Kai, Kai Kwamba, uh, we, we have like a, a, a different uh, image of the peace process, but women are continuing to mobilize because it's not just about having one woman, even in leadership position, that will make the difference, but we need to have a meaningful uh, inclusion on women, of women, but also of gender perspectives in the discussions of the peace process. I think just to end with the transition, uh, like in 2021, you know that the government uh, of the DRC and the, the MONUSCO signed a, a joint uh, like transition plan, which uh, included uh, gender and WPS with four of the 18 benchmarks uh, like expre ex expressly uh, mentioning uh, gender, women, uh, and the peace and security agenda. And out of the 83 indicators, this is analysis that was done uh, by UN Women at the time, out of the 83 indicators, 40% uh, uh, actually covered or were linked uh, to gender and WPS issues. Things uh, moved very fast. And uh, late 2023, we were now talking of the disengagement plan. So again, the government and the, the, the mission worked on this plan that was endorsed by the Security Council and which was considering the three phases of the mission's disengagement. Uh, the disengagement had a specific line on women, peace and security, and youth, peace and security. 
and in terms of, uh, I would say, rolling out or implementing uh, that uh, uh, disengagement plan, uh, internally the mission set up a steering committee uh, with different working groups on transition, uh, specifically seeing how we are we will working with agencies, funds and programs to support national authorities uh, at the mission's exit. There was also a, work, uh, a working group on base closure and TCC, PCC uh, withdrawal, uh, personal and welfare, communications and logistics, and from the gender affairs sections, you were actually tasked to see how to integrate gender and women peace and security in the work of uh, these uh, working groups, and, and we did that. In terms of implementation of the disengagement in South Kivu, uh, we moved from a, a specific priority on women, peace and security, youth, peace and security, to integrating gender and WPS across the four priorities of the provincial uh, transition plan, protection of civilians, human rights, strengthening the rule of law and state institutions, and support to DDR, uh, community, community recovery and stabilization. And what we also did for the, the disengagement in South, South Kivu was to work with UN Women to ensure that the, 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 the work that the mission had been doing on gender and WPS was uh, continued, taken forward, and we provided uh, gender capacity while UN Women committed to implementing uh, programs and uh, we signed an MOU. I think moving forward, and it's the last uh, part, I will say that we need to continue, obviously. We are still working on transition, uh, on disengagement, even if there is no like, specific uh, dates. And we are continuing to uh, strengthen uh, local capacities uh, for uh, uh, implementing the WPS ad agenda with the establishment and strengthening, for example, of local uh, steering committees with UN Women, with funding from Norway, and we did that work, uh, especially in Ituri. I can also mention that the work that needs to continue and on ensuring that women are involved in early warning, uh, local protection committees, uh, and contribute to their protection. I think I can stop there because there, there are many other points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and apologies, apologies to Rashi, but the time is not on our side. Um, you, know, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, my brother Andrew. Let me recognize uh, the ambassador of Norway and uh, my big brother also, Michael uh, Kingsley, uh, for also uh, being here. And uh, of course, the partners, Simpson Center, NUPI, KIPTC. And uh, I will say maybe more importantly, uh, the Department for Peace Operations for pulling all of this together and also inviting us. I'm happy to be here uh, representing my boss, Ambassador uh, Fatima Kiai Mohamed. I am Zino Enalgali. I'm Senior Political Coordinator at the Mission of the AU to the UN. I'm happy to be here again, not uh, just because uh, it is WPS week and uh, we are celebrating uh, this landmark resolution 2719, but um, also to contribute to these efforts in terms of uh, looking at what has been happening, the efforts we've been making, and now we also need to adapt our approaches as context change and as uh, we also encounter new dynamics. So I will make five quick points. I know I have seven minutes, I thought 10, but I'll try to see if I can do five, which I don't think I'll succeed, but let's see. And uh, the first point uh, I'll make is regarding AU's commitment. And uh, you will bear with me if I don't talk a lot about UN peacekeeping. I will talk a lot more about uh, AU's efforts and AU peace support operations and other broader efforts. So on AU's commitment, I am sure all of you are aware of uh, Agenda 2063, which is our own vision and aspiration. And Agenda uh, 2063 has aspiration six that uh, specifically emphasizes uh, gender equality and representation as well as participation of women and girls in peace and security efforts and uh, development uh, initiatives. Pretty much it calls for increased representation and participation of women in governance and decision-making processes aiming at gender parity in leadership positions. Many of you might also know of the AU gender policy of 2009, which of course also 
uh, calls for the promotion of women's leadership and also talks about uh, increased women's participation in conflict management, particularly participation of uh, women in peace operations, conflict resolution, post-conflict reconstruction and development. It specifically also stressed the need for our peacekeepers to be sensitized on gender aspects, pay inadequate attention to violence against women and children. You are all familiar also of the work of our special envoy. And uh, Madam Diop and her team have been doing great work, uh, briefing the Peace and Security Council, uh, following the guidance of the chairperson of the AU Commission and facilitating a lot of uh, important uh, efforts, including ensuring that um, we have a recognition of the critical role that women play in mediation, in peace building, conflict pre prevention and resolution. Again, I'm sure you all knew about our gender peace and security program that had been within the Department of Peace and Security but then um, that program ran from 2015 to 2020. And then with our new structure as part of the reform of the AU Commission, we now have uh, the Political Affairs, Peace and Security uh, Department, which has uh, one of its directorates, that is the Conflict Management Directorate. So Gender, Peace and Security now is a unit within the Office of the Director for Conflict Management. So not a program anymore, but a unit so more fully established in that regard. And um, that program then, uh, which is now a unit, now facilitates implementation and monitoring of uh, what we call a results framework on monitoring and reporting on implementation of the WPS agenda. And um, that monitoring framework spans from 2018 to 2028. And the team is working to finalize a strategy um, that will also guide uh, scaling up of uh, implementation of this uh, uh, results framework. And this results framework and the uh, uh, gender strategy has three key pillars. One includes existence, uh, ensuring that uh, existence of instruments to promote women's uh, participation in AU-led peace and security efforts. Uh, second, efforts undertaken to integrate gender and women's perspectives into peace and security initiatives and activities, and three measures taken by the AUC to capacitate our peace operations personnel in ensuring that they respect and promote women's rights and prevent uh, sexual gender-based uh, violence, including sexual exploitation and abuse. So these are key aspects that uh, not just reiterates our commitment, but also outlines the efforts that we are making and the instruments that guide us in all of these efforts. My second point then, I will want to highlight quickly some examples of how we've been uh, mainstreaming gender in peace operations. We've been doing that and then realized that uh, we need an assessment to capture it. So in between 2020 and 21, we actually did an assessment looking at how we've been doing that in PSO, but then specifically looking at AMISOM. And uh, the assessment took note that within the mission in Somalia, we have what we call a protection, human rights, and gender unit that facilitates all this work. And then we incorporate all these aspects together. And many of you might have heard about our uh, AU human rights compliance and accountability framework. So this is a more encompassing and overarching framework that includes our efforts to ensure uh, respect and implementation of all the obligations of uh, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, as well as conduct and discipline in this regard. So we took note then that um, gender is part of all of that, and that's how our units in the missions are structured. And then we coordinate gender activities within this broad framework. But then we wanted to understand the specifics of what we've been doing on uh, gender issues. And we realized then that there is need for a specific gender policy in this regard. And um, currently, uh, the colleagues that are working on the gender unit, like I mentioned, within the uh, uh, director's office and the Peace Support Operations Division focal points for gender, they're actually working on elaborating 
the outcomes of the assessment and its recommendations into a policy and a strategy. But I will just highlight a few other points in this regard. To indicate that in uh, 2021, we, we also uh, adopted a doctrine on peace support operations. There we, of course, uh, talked about um, gender mainstreaming, including child protection and all those issues uh, in peace support operations. Under our compliance framework, we have a suite of policies that includes uh, policy on uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, conduct and discipline. Um, just last week, we were looking at uh, a policy on remedial action in terms of looking at uh, how to ensure our response and remedial action is quite uh, uh, robust in addressing uh, these aspects when at all uh, these uh, uh, aspects are violated because the first aspect we try to do is to ensure prevention first before response and then see how to remedy these issues. And we also ensure that um, gender mainstreaming is part of planning of our operations. And that uh, when we launch those missions and in our management of those missions, these aspects are part of it and in our reporting. So even our reports to the council also cover these aspects. We took note also that um, we talk about increased participation of uh, women in peace operations. But then when, for instance, I was uh, head of peace support operations in Addis, I noted that in our notes verbal to our member states when they second officers or give contribution, they still give us more men. And we realize that they also cannot give what they don't have. So we then took note that one aspect of advocacy then should be that we encourage our member states that they increase the intake of women in their uh, uniformed uh, forces. So that uh, when we ask to our notes verbals for contribution, that they don't just give us the women they have, but they give us women that are qualified and can make the meaningful contribution in higher level positions of leadership to make the difference. For instance, you will see in Somalia, for instance, our uh, police commissioner is a woman. And we are happy for that because we don't just want military personnel that are just uh, uh, part of the troops that are doing just tactical level work, but that they are part of the senior mission leadership and decision making uh, uh, cadre. Again, uh, we try to make sure also that in our mandates that uh, these key aspects are there. So the aspect of protection, the aspect of prevention, the aspect of empowerment, so that in our efforts to support host states and their institutions, we help them with policy development, laws, and uh, a number of other capabilities that will enable them to also take these things forward. Not just when we are there in terms of the support we provide for them to do it, but again, for them to institutionalize it so that even when our missions would have been uh, liquidated, they will be able to continue these aspects. So we make sure also that even though pre-deployment training is not part of our responsibility as the AU, but that of troop and police contributing countries, in terms of the standards that we provide for them to follow, that we make sure they, they take note of these aspects and it is part of pre-deployment. And when we do pre-deployment verification, we check for these aspects. And we make sure that these are also aspects that are part of our in-mission training so that we sensitize even the personnel that are already on the ground. And our lessons learned aspect takes note of this within the context of our human rights compliance framework. But again, I think the assessment we had, like I mentioned, is one key aspect. I'll make my third point. I know my timing is not too much, but uh, please allow me to make this point because there will be a lot more points on UN peacekeeping. So let me also use the, the platform to talk about some of the great things that the AU does. And um, I cannot talk without uh, mentioning uh, some lessons from DRC. And I will say little about that because I know uh, we have the Monusco Repia and a number of other persons that will talk about that. Even the Epon study had also touched on that. But I think I'll make two points here to say it's critical that women are part of peace processes because peace, process, peace processes lead to agreements, peace agreements. And mandates of peace operations also are derived from these agreements. So that's how missions have their tasks. So it's quite critical then that we have women leaders that uh, had their forum uh, last week 
uh, as part of the efforts of uh, our champion for peace and reconciliation, the uh, uh, president of uh, Angola. And I think uh, from the AU side, we are quite happy with the outcome of, uh, of that engagement. So we took note of a couple of aspects, looking at uh, the continental results framework, which I mentioned, which again, like I said, outlines a number of aspects. Second, that uh, um, a mechanism has been proposed to include uh, women leaders that will support uh, local women's perspective and inclusion and uh, contribution to mediation efforts and all these aspects. And then thirdly, that the whole efforts of DDL will also take note of uh, 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 gender perspectives and that we should also ensure that um, we advocate for the strengthening of uh, uh, women's peace networks because um, we need to be able to utilize those capacities and capabilities at community level to then be able to popularize these initiatives at, at all levels. Uh, my last point then will be that, um, um, again, I took note that um, the organizers want us to talk about forward-looking aspects. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister here is the chief of gender within uh, the UN. I'd also been part of uh, the work we've been doing in terms of elaborating the modalities of uh, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2719. And uh, paragraph 13 of that resolution specifically emphasizes the importance of implementing uh, Resolution 1325. And uh, all of this, of course, points to ensuring that uh, the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women uh, is uh, prioritized including uh, as appropriate through the deployment of women as part of our operations. Again, I've mentioned some of the efforts we are undertaking in this regard. And within the roadmap that uh, the UN Secretary General and our chairperson of the commission uh, just endorsed uh, on Monday, three key aspects are outlined there. One is that uh, we should uh, conduct an assessment to look at the efforts that we've uh, undertaken and the extent to which we have implemented 1325 in peace operations. So for me, it would be good uh, working with the UN colleagues, of course, uh, with our colleagues in Addis. Beyond what we did in our assessment, what more can we say we need to look at and learn lessons from and take forward? Secondly, um, we are already working on the point that uh, is in that roadmap talking about having a gender mainstreaming policy or guideline. But then to see how uh, we can also learn some lessons from the UN uh, in terms of how you've been doing it and uh, what more we can add to the draft that we have that we actually plan to take forward uh, to, to, to engage with other key stakeholders on early next year. And then um, lastly, to look at uh, what key operational planning documents that we have that are still useful for utilization or that we can revise or also elaborate, taking note of uh, a number of other developments. So we look forward to, to, to working with the UN in that regard in terms of uh, the implementation of um, this also landmark resolution on financing of peace operations. And I cannot stop talking without uh, indicating that Sierra Leone uh, held a session uh, of the council last month during, uh, in August, sorry, during their presidency, looking at WPS in the context of transition. And I'll just make one point there before I keep quiet, which is that as missions draw down, what efforts are we all going to continue making to make sure that the gains that we would have made whether through the peace agreements or through the efforts of peace operations and the support to local authorities, whether from central government or at community level, that those gains are not reversed. How do we ensure that women continue to have security and are protected? And how do we ensure that that empowerment drive that we would have infused into our efforts in supporting the country continues? that they institutionalize it and take all these efforts forward, not just in laws, but in implementing all these aspects and ensuring that these efforts are sustained. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doc, you have the, you have the floor. Yes. Well, 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to say, Andrew. Um, everything has been said, so you've saved some seven minutes. But um, because Andrew has called me, I have to say something nonetheless. Um, for me, I think these are just um, some personal thoughts that I'm going to share about the study and you know how I've um, observed um, some phenomena in the region with respect to um, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda over the last few years. Um, the study is a wonderful study. I mean, the, the, the breadth of people that you spoke to, the report is really very detailed, and it showed um, the, the depth of work that is um, being undertaken in um, DR Congo, which is a, a difficult environment to, to operate in, a um, big country that has so many um, challenges. And it's interesting um, that the, the other gender advisors are, are here um, to, to share ideas with, with their colleagues. And for me, I think the experiences of DR Congo um, reflects the experiences of some of the other countries um, in which there are peace operations. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of learning that's taking place um, this weekend, I'm sure within your, your networks. For, for me as well, one of the other takeaways from this report um, is the fact that in very complex environments such as in DR Congo, um, of the four WPS um, pillars in the um, 1325, it's usually the protection and relief and recovery that take precedence over, over the other two. Uh, because of the difficulties with getting a lot more women to participate, how do you do that when um, you don't even have a, a peaceful environment in the first place. Um, but nonetheless, there is still a lot of work that takes place um, within that framework, but not as much as you know the protection and the relief and, and recovery aspect. And so there's a lot, of, a lot more success when it comes to, to, to that. Then also the report for me, um, having worked on conflict-related sexual violence um, for a number of years, um, demonstrate some of the catastrophic failures um, of the, I wouldn't call it the, I don't know, the WPS agenda to maybe prevent sexual violence in conflict, the, the large scale attacks against women and girls, which um, over the years um, I was surprised to read hasn't reduced. It's actually now started increasing over the last um, few years. And I think that for me um, breaks my heart um, because um, one would have thought that with a lot of the work that's been put into it, um, this would have reduced. However, um, it, is, it is not because of the societies within which um, we are at. Our societies are, are, are you know, the toxic masculinity um, in which we, we operate in. You know, this is what is causing it. And so if we are not able to resolve that, um, then it would um, con continue. Again, um, the, the, the report for me um, also, um, one thing that stood out was how the, the, the language of, of the WPS language and mission mandates have, have evolved over the years, and that is really very encouraging. They are very positive efforts to ensure that no matter what text, framework, policy is being designed, that the WPS language is there, and not just there, that it makes a strong um, impact. So I think that is really very good. And it resonates, I think, listening to Zeno um, talking, um, it's even um, cascaded down to, um, or up to the regional organizations and the sub-regional organizations in terms of ensuring that WPS um, makes a strong um, impact in all the regional um, documents that are are being done. The other thing also um, that I wanted to reflect on um, was um, in the report was about the, the limited gender re resources that are allocated to, to WPS, um, which I think is it's, it's, it's a shame. <laughs> um, I think we are going to call a spade a spade, isn't it, uh, within this, this setting? And, I think um, having a policy without dedicating resources to it, what are we doing? Um, you have to put your money to it um, if you're really committed. It's not just about putting three clauses in a policy and, and leaving it there for, 
for people to take action. There has to be allocation of resources. You do not say put women in a particular position and not create an environment within which those women can operate. That needs resources, right? You know, so those are all some of the things that um, we need to um, emphasize on. And then uh, maybe just a few more points about implications for you know, maybe the work that I do in, in the region and some of our, our colleagues do in, in the region. And I think Zinu um, alluded to the fact that within um, the Political Affairs, Peace and Security Commissions, there has been active um, steps to have um, gender units, gender advisors, um, which um, even within ECOWAS wasn't the case. Um, so um, I think there's a lot of effort in that. And, and so I think there has been significant learning and sharing of experiences between the UN and regional organizations, which I think is a very um, good, good point. And Zinu already touched on the, the roadmap, which you know, it's, it's good to know that it's been um, accepted and that they are key WPS indicators um, within it. And I think beyond that, it's important that you know, the accountability measures, the monitoring, the evaluation, all include um, WPS aspect if we really want to um, take it seriously. Because as the report noted, and as we all know, there really hasn't been any UN peacekeeping mandate since 2014. And so a lot of the new mandates are evolving in the, in the regions. And so it's important that a lot of attention is focused on, 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 on the African Union and its regional organizations to support them in the, you know, if we want to make um, a, a good impact in the, the WPS um, agenda. And obviously, similar to the um, UN missions, um, the nature of, of regional peace operations is such that um, the protection as well as the relief and recovery will take precedence over the others because these are strong peace enforcement mandates. And so um, we, we still need to find a way to bring in the, the WPS agenda um, there um, and ensure that it's taken seriously. And um, it's, it's actually in, interesting to, to note um, that, uh, maybe just for information, recently ECOWAS has uh, deployed um, a gender advisor to the, their mission in Guinea-Bissau, which, which hasn't you know, been the case. You know? So I think this is really very, very good. And then the other thing that I also want to emphasize is, is the need to, and this came out a bit in the, in the report about working very closely with with women's organizations, grassroots organizations, because a lot of the time, um, when it comes to the participation aspect and some of the relief and recovery efforts, they take precedence and they do a lot of the, the work there and the places where you know, we all cannot be all the time. And so it's important that we work very closely with, with those um, organizations and, and for the um, AU, ECOWAS, you know, which have very strong civil society um, groups, ECOSOC, WAXI, WAXOF, um, that we work very closely with these organizations to support the work that we are doing. And then for me, at the, at the training level, as a trainer, I think sometimes we take it for granted that because we talk so much about women, peace, and security, everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows what we want to do. Um, but you'd be surprised that in a training session when you start talking about some of the gender issues, there's really very little knowledge. Um, even for, for yesterday, we had a session where some of the gender advisors even need um, training, you know, lots of skills. And so beyond the, a lot of the talk, we need to train um, people and not take it for granted that everybody knows because there's a lot of noise that is being made. There is a lot of ignorance out there. And so we do not, should, we should not um, um, take it for, for granted. And then um, finally, just um, my concluding thoughts, um, just my final thought um, on, on the fact that, you know, listening to Mireille, listening to um, Jenny and, and shows that Lisa shows that um, a lot of work has been done and I'm sure when we open the floor and we listen to colleagues from from the field and at the um, headquarter level you know people will talk about a lot of the work that's been done 
Um, I think sometimes you can feel really very frustrated um, that you are not making the impact that you think you should. Um, but it's also little steps, little successes, you know. And sometimes when you read the, the reports, the EPON report, you think, oh, um, so, so, so what has been achieved, <laughs> right? Um, what was prevented? Um, but I think for, for those in the field, it's little successes. You know, when um, a little girl is able to go to school without, you know, being attacked, um, when a woman that has been raped get a little bit of support, and you know some psychosocial support. So it's those little successes that I think should um, propel us to to the next um, to the next step. So and that, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. So we we have a strict twenty minutes, a very very strict twenty minutes um, uh, for questions uh, and. For colleagues on in the floor but also online as well um, so when you are called upon please just quickly introduce yourself and have a synced question now this statement just a quick quick question I emphasize that so that we can get as many people in as possible um, and what I'm also going to do is I'm going to request that if the gender advisors who are in the room from the field if you could take the first three questions and then we'll go to others as well uh, so you have preference uh, over other people. So um, I'll open the floor for the gender uh, advisors if they want to ask a question, please. And then the, yep. Yeah. Yes, please, yes. I don't know how to operate the mic, so. Uh, okay, so. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. My name is Kasumi Nishigaya. I am Senior Gender Advisor of UMI, South Sudan. And I have a question uh, about the study. Um, I'm very interested in the role of the international, uh, um, how do you call it, international human rights instruments, or even regional instruments, uh, like in the case of OMIS, uh, it's relevant to talk about African Union uh, related uh, regional human rights instruments. I want to know to what extent they have also played the role in terms of uh, uh, localizing the principle of that message into you know, uh, the empowerment of women. What kind of roles that also the mission played in, um, how do you call it, populating the awareness across the stakeholders and concretizing uh, actions of the national institutions, civil society, and also citizens overall. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Judith Mirembe from UNSOS Somalia, and uh, my question goes to African Union. And um, thank you very much for that elaborate uh, discussion that uh, we've really had on the research. Uh, just to hit back to just discuss about uh, the support that the African Union is providing uh, in uh, Somalia. Uh, UNSOS provides logistical support, and we are working on seeing how we can include a gender perspective into the logistical support that we provide to the ATMIS uh, mission. However, you spoke about having the portfolio of the gender advisor together with human rights and protection. And we think this area is really large, one person having three portfolios managing this, and you find that the WPS agenda falls through the cracks when some one person is providing protection, child protection, and uh, WPS compliance. You find that uh, WPS falls through the cracks. As we are moving into this transition, and you have a lot of uh, other good policies that uh, the African Union is uh, developing and having a gender unit at the HQ level. Can it also be replicated at the field level to have a WPS gender unit separately so that we can be more effective in the delivery of, uh, of your work? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
And for me, it's a very great report um, hearing and um, uh, having some uh, background of a little bit of MINUSMA, because I was a, also a gender advisor at MINUSMA, and we see some um, great success and some challenges and gaps that we can learn from. Um, having also been right now in Kosovo, in UNMIC, where we have three other missions, where when we do the learn best, best practices, lesson learned, um, with AU, uh, with this 2719 um, resolution. This is, there are a uh, lot of rooms where we can learn from and see what, what, what did not work well in, um, in Mali, per se, or Congo, and also what have worked well in, uh, in the Kosovo UNMIC uh, side and what we can do more. Um, so this is something that I wanted to make a comment, and um, the main um, for me is resources. When I see these good policies, um, good strategies being, uh, being written, um, what are the resources there that we take advantage from um, when we're talking about this transition from the AU, from the UN? Um, what can we learn and how can we do it better? Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, so we have three questions. I'm gonna point to Miro to answer the first one in 45 seconds, Zinu. <laughs> 45 seconds on the on source, please, if you can. And then the third question, maybe to both of you and, and anyone else that wants to chip in. Sorry, time is, I know, hate me, I know, I know, but time is not on our side. So I'm trying to get as many questions as possible. Please, Miro. Right. And just to say that the mission has uh, actually a joint human rights office, so it's both mission and OHCHR. Uh, it's also good to know that the, the DRC has uh, national mechanisms on the human rights promotion uh, and protection, and uh, I'm sure they, they utilize them uh, from the GHRO side uh, in terms of implementing uh, the human rights mandate of uh, MONUSCO. 45 questions, thank you. <laughs> Yes, no, thanks for the question. On, uh, on ONSOS, you might be aware because uh, you have been facilitating a lot of aspects uh, for us, like you mentioned. When we started AMISOM and then building into what we have now in terms of the logistic support from a centralized support to a decentralized support under ATMIS, a lot have, have happened and you have been uh, instrumental in that regard. One is that um, we, were in, we were in Nairobi, and then we moved to Mogadishu, and then we had uh, the kind of uh, even housing that we had for our personnel. And we had to request, and you, you facilitated, having just accommodation that ensures that the women have uh, basic facilities within their rooms, not to go outside to actually uh, uh, do personal things. That was one. Two, you encouraged uh, or you enabled us uh, to have uh, personal effects and we as for women that uh, we had not uh, uh, budgeted for. And I don't think that had ever been part of UN uh, uh, budget line items that you were able to provide for us because we, we, are in a con we are still in a condition where in we cannot have the women go out to buy things at the supermarket. And you try to include that as you when within your own budget and uh, logistic support that you provide to ensure that we have those uh, key aspects. Again, um, if I go forward, I will talk a lot more about um, us working together within uh, the working groups in uh, Somalia with UNSOM inclusive. Again, also working with the government in terms of also knowing what are some of the uh, uh, laws that they also want to uh, 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 um, uh, put in place as part of their own governance and rule of law and uh, uh, processes. Again, within the context of our protection of civilians uh, work, we also facilitate same. And uh, maybe I should go straight then to the point that you raised about uh, separating gender and the old human rights compliance framework. I'm not uh, in any way saying that uh, 
we will just, it will be lost. But I do understand what you mean, because I do recall when we started uh, the work with the UN when I was with Accord uh, around 2010, when we are talking about uh, uh, mainstreaming protection of civilians versus having a unit by itself. So it's similar also with gender, to say that we have a whole protection human rights and gender as a unit, but we do have specific staff to deal with each of the issues. So not that we have a compliance person that then have to do child protection and all of that. Of course, without uh, 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 the requisite capacity to have the specific staff for each of those issues, that's where we will have a challenge. But once we have the requisite staff for gender, they will focus on the WPS agenda. The staff for protection will facilitate the entire protection of civilians' uh, work. The aspect on conduct and discipline, then you have the staff dealing with that. So that's the approach that we use, knowing that how many units can we have to deal with this aspect. Because you will have uh, a gender officer dealing with protection issues also, when you also have compliance looking at protection, you also have protection of civilians looking at protection. So those are just the ways we try to streamline uh, the work and task versus how to streamline, harmonize, integrate, and coordinate all of that, and ensure that they all speak to each other also to also maximize impact. But your point is uh, noted, but I needed to elaborate our own approach. And uh, I'm sure the, the, the gender chief will tell you how that discussion have been in the whole uh, uh, AUUN working group on uh, the task force for 27-19 and the UN also asking similar questions to say, why do we have to have one work stream that deal with women, peace and security, protection issues, conduct and discipline, and human rights? But we said, when we want to talk to you on women, peace and security, we will have the officers deal with you. When we want to talk to you also on human rights, we will have those officers to also work with you. So pretty much we just tried to pull everything together and coordinate, but we, stood, we still do have the, the, the specific officers dealing with each of those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the question on resources in transitions, I'll make four really quick points. Um, I think, first of all, guidance with clear responsibilities. What is each entity doing, whether it's the UN or the AU or partners on the ground, needs to be clearly articulated. I think, second, accountability. If you don't have accountability in place at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to move forward in implementing recommendations, and I think that's why the gender scorecard was quite innovative. Um, and I think holding accountability, not just for, for leadership, but everyone across the mission, this is a skill you need. Third, funding. I won't go into that any further. And then fourth, I think political will. You need the political will. Um, and if you don't have that at the end of the day, you are not going to find progress in this space. And I will wrap it up there just before 45 seconds. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, uh, one more wave of questions. Um, are there any more questions, please, uh, gentlemen? Okay, so we have, I see six hands. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's seven. Okay. We'll go here, 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 the two gentlemen here, and then over here, and then over here, please, yeah? Yeah, seven, yeah. Brilliant. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So my question is coming from a recommendation that was made in another forum yesterday concerning the rotation of military gender advisors, because we know it's usually one country that um, has a different mission, that remains in different mission. My question is between 2010 and 2021, from the report, what will you consider as the advantage of this system, and will you recommend that it's rotated instead of them being the same from the same country? Uh, you forgot you. to introduce yourself quickly. Dr. Anamensa from KIPTC. Thank, Thank you. from the United Nations University, former PUC officer in MINUSMA. I have a quick question um, concerning the gender scorecard. How do we ensure that, um, that this does not lead to yet another reporting mechanism, but that it actually really sees some, some tangible uh, um, effects on the ground and, and actions? And thank you for, for this really interesting uh, event. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I saw a, two hands over here. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, one question from online participants. Uh, Dr. Sharma is asking, how effective are the FETs, female engagement teams, in MONUSCO? 
Did the study address this critical factor, enabling community outreach, especially to the women? Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman here, and then. Yes, uh, Mohamed Bad from the French Mission, so I'm going to continue in French. Uh, merci beaucoup pour cette... Thank you very much for hosting this event. I just wish to, to reaffirm the fact that France attributes significance, great significance to the fact that the issue of the women's full participation in the mandate of MINUSCO is fully taken into account. Thank you for presenting us with all of the innovations in both the mandate and your efforts on the ground. These are very valuable. My question has to do with the preparations for the disengagement process. What, in your view, are the priorities? Where where should there be a focus in terms of the uh, conduct of this process? Thank you. Thank you very much. The lady here, please. Sorry. Vic Cabrera Beleza from the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. How can we further enhance the role of gender advisor and provo provide them with greater support? There's so much demand for them, and in a country like DRC, it's a huge country, and and uh, we work with local um, local um, authorities and grassroots civil society there. So, uh, the increased support, increased uh, resources would really enhance that partnership in ensuring that the women, peace, and security agenda is implemented and uh, implemented and led by the people who are actually affected by conflicts and crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then the final question from here, please. Uh, I'm, my name is Erica Bassi. I work currently with DPPA, but until last year was the deputy director of the Joint Human Rights Office at MONUSCO. Um, I think that I just had a quick question. Um, we've heard some recommendations, but I, I think from my experience, there does tend to be a fragmentation of the WPS agenda within peacekeeping missions. Um, the Human Rights uh, Office has its uh, senior women's protection advisor, the, the force, the police have their own initiatives on WPS. Um, and then there's also the senior gender, gender affairs advisor. So uh, just a question as to some recommendations. We heard about the gender scorecard, but other recommendations as to how to ensure a cohesive WPS agenda within a mission. Thank you. Excellent. So we have six questions. First on rotation, second on uh, targeted effects, third on FCT and effectiveness, fourth on the preparation for disengagement, the fifth on enhancement of gender advisors, and the last one on... Uh, if I sum it up correctly, fragmentation between the missions as well. Um, so who would like to respond uh, on which one first? Should we go to... Yeah. I'll jump in very quickly, then go to colleagues. Um, and I apologise, I, I won't necessarily go in order, but I wanted to, to address a couple of the issues that jumped out. To start first on the question of fragmentation, um, I think one of the challenges here is ensuring coherent leadership within the mission on WPS, making sure it's prioritised. And I would say making sure there's not just a focus on quantitative indicators, but also looking at the qualitative narrative around what is happening in the mission. And sometimes there's a tendency to elevate the statistics. They're very easy to grab into segregated data. But I think there is also a need to focus on the qualitative. On the disengagement process, I can't stress enough, I think, the importance on national capacity and making sure there is a mapping and understanding of needs as missions start to draw down. And then very briefly on the question around female engagement teams, one of the challenges is when you're bringing in national capacities in a peacekeeping mission is trying to find um, uh, liaison assistance um, or local capacities who can engage and work with the force who also happen to be women, either because of education or cultural restrictions or a whole host of things. And while that doesn't go specifically to female engagement teams or mixed engagement teams, making sure you find those local capacities is really key to making sure that the mission can engage with local communities. I'll stop there and let others jump in, Andrew. Thank you so much. Gender advisors yep. uh, from MONUSCO, they are usually from the UK, and uh, I think so far it's working well. And uh, I, I know there's an issue about uh, handover uh, between the, the military gender advisor, but what we have seen is the 
the new one often arrives before the, the previous one leaves, and they are able to, uh, to prepare the, the, like a smooth uh, handover. That's what I can say. In terms of gender, the gender scorecard and how to make sure that uh, it has uh, like a concrete impact on the ground, I just want to say that uh, the gender scorecard by itself will not uh, make uh, changes. I think it's part of a, a set of tools for uh, monitoring, for reporting, uh, for accountability. And linked to that, I just want to go back to the question on the resources. Like when we look at the budgets uh, of peacekeeping uh, missions, they are huge. So I think we, we, we probably, and member states, uh, could do a, 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 an improved work, I would say, in terms of tracking uh, allocations uh, made to uh, gender and WPS within the, the missions uh, budgets. Uh, I think it's something that we, we can do. In terms of the female engagement teams, I think there's also an... Uh, to improve their engagement, uh, not only to move towards mixed engagement teams or patrols or platoons uh, within the militaries, but also to strengthen uh, the, the collaboration between military and civilians so that we have a, a, a stronger analysis and then like attempt of response uh, to the needs of the communities. Uh, pour uh, le, le désengagement. On oh, a disengagement, I'm happy to be able to speak French. So, I think that regarding this process, well, the priorities have already been established, but if we're looking ahead in the process, of course, we need to keep protection of civilians as a priority. And I think that's also the idea that's been adopted now, not with the withdrawal of the mission from an entire province. They should they should not do that without looking at the areas, the territories where civilian protection needs remain high. Also, I think we should also look at the priorities that have been established by the government and then work with the government to try and make progress on their priorities. We talk about this in DRC a lot, and yes, it's a priority of the government, and of the mission, therefore. So we know as we prepare for the disengagement is aligned with those priorities. So to go back to the women, peace and security gender question, Congolese government has just adopted a national strategy on positive masculinity. And positive masculinity is also part of prevention of sexual and gender-based violence, for example, including in the security sector. And this is, a work, this is something that MONUSCA has been doing since... 2019 with the FLDC, and it is now a governmental priority. That should probably continue. Was addressed, and I will. Pardon. Oui, oui. Et donc, I think was on fragmentation of WPS within the mission. It's fine. Uh, we have the gender affairs sections. We have a network of gender focal points. I think we also need to say that we have about. 30 uh, gender experts within the mission uh, which are, uh, who are in their respective sections and components and make sure that uh, the work is uh, gender inclusive, gender responsive. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add to the question on disengagement, the special representative of the Secretary General or deputy rep special representative was there a couple of days ago and made a brief presentation of what that could, disengagement could look like. As you know, in South Kivu, that's been done already. For North Kivu and Ituri, the government asked for that to be delayed a little, but the important information on women, peace and security is that the country team from the UN is working on mapping of this, of the skills and capacity. And it's there, I think, that we need to ensure that the gender advisors and for women, peace and security, we need to make sure that they're part of this process for mapping. That's very important. And also be based on this disengagement which took place in South Kivu, where, for example, there is a human rights office which will be open, or maybe it's already open, but it shows actually that we are 
moving on from having one person to having an entire unit to work on human rights related issues. For example, this includes women's rights too. So we'll keep an eye on that and make sure it's done uh, as pen holder, as we hope. We hope that for the ma mandates will make sure that women, peace and security is still featured in all the work on transition and disengagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I would now like to um, hand the floor to Her Excellency Ambassador uh, Merita Flea uh, Bratestad, uh, who is the permanent representative uh, of Norway to the United Nations, who also provides some closing remarks as well. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Chair. And I would say also a special thank you to the researchers and to all the panelists uh, for this morning. And I do believe we can all agree that it has been an interesting morning. The lessons learned and the insights from the panelists about mainstreaming um, the women, peace and security dimensions into the mandate of MONESCO should be considered in future missions. While the original mandate of MONESCO had a rather narrow understanding of the WPS at the outset, it evolved over time to also include a more substantive focus on women's participation in conflict prevention and political processes. Two observations uh, are made in this regard. First, it is critical to have the correct and necessary language in the mandate from the start, as this defines the boundaries for what is possible and what is not possible. Second, it is important to be able to evolve and adapt the mandate when necessary. However, none of this should be taken for granted. We see a more difficult environment today than ever before. Recent numbers show a disconcerting trend where gendered language and focus is not included in Security Council resolutions. Women, peace and security remains an important key element of Norway's security policy and in our efforts uh, to promote peace and security in general. And we are very pleased to now take over as co-chair for the WPS um, focal point uh, network this week. This gives us a platform to continue to promote this very important agenda. And in doing so, Norway recognizes the disproportionate impact of conflict on women and girls, but also women's vital contribution to peace and security for all. And among all war-related issues, we cannot avoid addressing conflict-related sexual violence as a method of war, as a peace and security issue, hampering reconciliation and restoration efforts and pe perpetuating uh, a cycle of violence. Conflict-related sexual violence continues to be widespread in the DRC with devastating impact on the social cohesion, driving displacement and instability. So conflict-related sexual violence disproportionately, of course, affects women and girls and contribute to broader gender inequalities, while also obviously impacting boys and men. Norway believes that peacekeeping is a critical tool to address conflict-related sexual violence. When given the right mandate, it can, tr can contribute to a global prevention and response strategy. With the gradual withdraw withdrawal of MONUSCO, there is a risk of increased conflict-related sexual violence. Therefore, the transition process must be carefully planned, prepared, and supported to ensure that achievements in CRSV prevention and response is not lost. The Women, Peace, and Security agenda in peacekeeping is an operational necessity and a priority for UN peacekeeping. We need to find ways to continue observing accountable, effective, and responsive approaches to a WPS mandate being implemented in all peacekeeping. 
We hope that the lessons and recommendations on women, peace and security approaches from MINUSCO will inspire further and future efforts in other UN peacekeeping missions. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who contributed today uh, with insights, with knowledge and with good questions. We look forward to continue working together to promote the WPS agenda and to challenge the backlash to gender equality that we are confronted with. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, colleagues. And that brings us to the end. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement from, from our side. Uh, thank you to the director uh, for Central Southern Africa Division for DPPA, DPPO, uh, Michael Kinsey for being here, uh, to Catherine, Ruth, and Sandra and Lucas for helping organizing this event and for all the efforts in the background, uh, to Lisa, to Yeni, uh, also acknowledging um, Asal here in the room from Triple CPA who uh, helped lead uh, and, and, and spearhead the report, to our panelists, Muriel, uh, Zinu, and Emma, uh, and Your Excellency as well uh, for being here today. Uh, and thank you. I uh, guess, and apologies again for having to rush through uh, things, but yeah, have a lovely day and thank you for your contributions. Today.